<clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, before I begin, let me quickly apologize for my voice. I left it together with the AC on the plane. And yeah, so I can no longer sing the tenor. So um, as Nico well, already said, um, today I want to talk about the future of Apache Flink deployments in particular, um, how we envision the integration with containers, Kubernetes, and more. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so let's start. So um, to begin with, I would like to take a look back at the evolution of um, Flink's APIs and the use cases um, they enabled. So basically everything started out with the dataset API, which was actually already introduced um, in um, the predecessor project to Apache Flink called Stratosphere. And with the dataset API, <clears throat> we could basically uh, process um, analytic batch workloads. Uh, it should not take long until Flink learns how to stream. I think in the middle of 2014, the data stream API was introduced, which um, for the first time enabled to, to uh, continuously process uh, streams of data. The next addition was uh, the process function. And the process function <coughs> um, gave access to the Flink's state and timers and enabled for the first time to build event-driven applications. If we compare this evolution with the evolution of deployment options, we actually can sum it up that the deployment options uh, lagged a bit behind in speed, um, couldn't keep up. So uh, what we currently have in terms of um, deployment options are the session cluster, <coughs> which means that um, is a Flink cluster to which you can submit multiple jobs, and um, a specialization of that, the um, job mode or job cluster, which means that you um, deploy um, a job, um, or that, that you have a cluster which only can run a single job. Um, but in particular, if you want to <coughs> develop event-driven application, this does not feel natural, that you have to think about clusters and have to manage it. So what we um, want to work towards is a feature what we call Flink as a library. The idea is that um, application deployments should become as easy as starting a simple process. So you can think of it that Flink um, would, um, would be as any other library which you add to your application and would not affect how you deploy it. Um, and if you want to deploy and run such an application in um, parallel, you would simply start a set of um, processes which will connect to each other, figure out their roles. Like one will become the job manager, and the others will become the task managers um, in order to execute um, the application in, in parallel. And that way, it will basically remove the cluster completely out of the equation. So you don't have to, to um, think about it um, and just have simply processes. And if you see that the application cannot keep up with the workload, you start some um, new processes. Um, if we take a look at um, how tightly in, in, in control Flink needs to be in, uh, with respect to resource management uh, for different use cases, we see the following picture. Um, for batch workloads, um, you usually have um, um, a topology which consists of multiple short-lived stages compared um, to I mean, always compared to um, streaming programs where operators run for the whole time. Um, and these stages in, a, in your, your batch topology usually have um, vastly different resource requirements. <clears throat> so a mapper might uh, almost need no resource at all, whereas a reducer usually needs more memory and CPU cycles. And here, it's beneficial. Uh, for Flink to, to be able um, or to, to be in control of the resource management, being able to, to start um, new task managers and release them. If it sees that now a new st stage comes up, which needs to be scheduled, which needs more resources than currently are available. <clears throat> in contrast to that, the um, event data-driven uh, applications are Long running continuously uh, processing uh, or consists of long running continuously processing operators. 
These applications are usually constrained by um, external systems with which they interact, like with which fl uh, Flink application interacts, and SLAs. And it's often easier um, to make the resource, uh, or the decision how many resources this uh, system should get, from a, um, not from within Flink, but from a holistic view, uh, where you um, can also reason about the other external systems with which Flink interacts. Moreover, you could also um, take into account um, some application logic, um, which you um, put into this external system. And um, so Flink does not really need to be able to, to um, actively allocate um, task managers. The only thing it needs to do is to react to newly available slots it gets and um, scale the job accordingly. So, considering um, these things, we basically realized that um, the current execution mode, which we call the active execution mode, is not uh, sufficient enough to cover all the different um, use cases to make the, the experience smooth. <clears throat> so in the active um, execution mode, Flink basically knows about the underlying um, one-time environment uh, in which it runs. So it can talk to, um, if it runs in a, uh, um, <clears throat> on a, on a um, cluster framework, it can, can talk to the cluster manager to request new task managers uh, and release them. Examples which you currently have in the code base are the, the YARN integration and Mesos. Um, there Flink basically talks to, um, uh, to the resource, YARN resource manager to, to request new containers if it sees that it does not have enough slots to run a job. The new mode which we want to introduce is um, the so-called reactive uh, mode. Here, Flink is oblivious to its underlying one-time environment um, and an external system is responsible for deciding how many task managers are running. And um, the job manager will simply take whatever it gets uh, and then uh, scale the job up to the um, max person it can, can run the job with. And this mode, uh, will bring us uh, a step towards the Flink as a library feature and uh, will be, um, or we think is, is well suited for containerized um, deployments as we will see later on. <clears throat> of course, um, for the reactive mode and also for the active mode um, uh, to properly work, uh, we need auto scaling. Um, so Flink jobs need to be able to adjust its parallelism. Um, the idea here is <clears throat> to introduce rescaling policies, uh, which one can um, define for every operator. So um, every operator will have a way to tell Flink um, that it needs to scale up or scale down. And if Flink has enough resources and thinks this is possible, it will uh, try to do it. Um, you can think of various signals which you can use to, to actually um, signal scale up or down events. So for example, you could monitor metrics like latency or throughput. Um, you could also consider uh, signals from, from external systems with which you interact. Or it could be, uh, as, in, as uh, in the reactive mode, the number of available resources which could trigger such a um, um, scaling event. <clears throat> All right, um, so much for the reactive mode for the moment. Um, another trend we've seen in the Flink community is um, that more and more people deploy um, Flink in containerized environments. Um, I guess since, since most of you are running Flink uh, jobs in production, you know better than me why this is the case. Just let, let me spell it out um, uh, why I think at least um, it's, it's popular. So containerized uh, deployments, um, better separate concerns. So by defining a container which bundles everything, like your application code, um, um, the Flink code, um, the configs, uh, and so on, um, it becomes a self-contained unit. You could even, with the um, standalone job cluster entry point, also bundle the, the uh, user jar into the container such that you don't have to, to uh, submit the job once the cluster comes up. Um, Having such a container, the operations become quite easy. Uh, and also um, scaling up or down, if the application supports um, rescaling, 
becomes uh, quite easy. You simply change your Kubernetes, the replica account of your deployment, for example. And um, you might have already guessed it, the reactive mode is uh, something which uh, should enable this for Flink. But not everyone is, is running um, data-driven applications on Kubernetes. Uh, we've also seen that people actually um, deploy session clusters on Kubernetes to run batch workloads. Um, and as, I, as I've said, for batch workloads, it's beneficial if Flink is in charge of um, the resource management. And um, that's why the community is also working on an active integration with, with um, Kubernetes. <coughs> I guess it also does not come uh, as a surprise that we picked Kubernetes as the de facto industry standard for container orchestration. Um, but also here, let me uh, just say some words. So Kubernetes, yeah, <coughs> is, is widespread. It has a really a nice resource-oriented uh, and declarative API. So you basically say what the target state should be and all the details uh, how to get there from the current state to reconcile the current state into the uh, target state um, will be taken care of by Kubernetes. Um, to set the stage for um, the next slides, let me quickly um, um, well, define some terminology in case you shouldn't know. Um, so the basic abstraction of, or one of the abstractions of Kubernetes is a pod. And a pod um, is basically a group of one or more uh, containers running on a node. And in order to manage n identical pods, you can define a deployment, which gives you um, ways to, to scale um, the number of the, the pods up or down by changing the replica count. All right, um, these are the terms we need for um, the active Kubernetes integration. All right, now let's take a look a bit more in detail um, at the active and reactive mode. Before we um, take a look at the uh, active Kubernetes integration, I want to quickly recap um, <coughs> the, the changes the Flink community did to um, Flink's distributed architecture in the context of Flip 6. And I want to show how easy it is now with uh, this change to integrate um, different uh, cluster managers uh, with Flink. So one of the goals of Flip 6 was to uh, pull um, the few components we had apart uh, to better separate the concerns um, and to make the whole code base more maintainable and, and extensible. Um, in order to improve operations, we also added a RESTful API for the client cluster communication so that um, since now all cluster client communication um, happens via HTTP, it um, should be far easier to integrate it with um, third party tools and, and um, write your own custom solutions. And uh, with Flip 6, it was actually, uh, we added resource elasticity, meaning that Flink can start and, and stop um, task managers um, as needed. So, how do these uh, components um, play together? So, when you have a cluster running <clears throat> and you want to submit a job, you use a client for that. The client um, submits the job via the RESTful API to the dispatcher, which is the um, submission endpoint. The Responsibility of the dispatcher is to actually um, well, to start a job manager, which is responsible for executing the job. In order to execute the job, you need some resources in the form of slots, and the job manager asks the resource manager for these slots. <coughs> the resource manager, if it sees that there are not enough slots available in your cluster, uh, will talk to the cluster manager to start some um, more task managers uh, to get more resources. Once these task managers come up, <clears throat> they will register at the job manager and together with the job manager um, start executing uh, the job. That's basically how um, the components play together. Uh, one important point here is that the resource manager is the only component interacting with the um, external system. Um, so meaning that this is also the only component uh, which we, for which we need to, to add a, a special implementation to add an active integration uh, with Flink, as we will see um, in a second on this slide. So how does this look like uh, for the active Kubernetes integration? So um, in order to, to start a Flink session cluster, you first need to um, 
tell Kubernetes about it. So you usually define, um, or one way to do it is to define a Kubernetes deployment where um, the, the single port you start is the application master. <clears throat> so once you do this, um, the Kubernetes deployment controller will um, start this, this port and um, the application master port runs the dispatcher and the Kubernetes resource manager. So that's the um, new component, basically. Um, in order to submit a job to the, um, to the cluster, um, you usually, if you want to do it from, from uh, outside of the Kubernetes cluster, you define a, a Kubernetes um, service to expo uh, expose the port. And the client um, can, by using this, send um, the job to the dispatcher. Then, as <coughs> um, We've also seen the previous slide, we start the job manager and the job manager requests the slots. And now um, what the Kubernetes resource manager uh, does, the first time it receives the slot request, it will tell um, the Kubernetes deployment controller about the task manager deployment. The task manager deployment defines, uh, among others, the um, container uh, image for the task manager pod. <clears throat> and uh, once the Kubernetes resource manager has, has um, submitted this deployment, it becomes really easy to scale up and down um, for the resource manager. It simply needs to, to change the replica count. So then the task manager pods get started and they register at the resource manager. The resource manager tells them about the, which of their slots is needed by which job manager and they will give these slots or offer these slots to the job manager and then the job gets executed. That's more or less <clears throat> how um, the active Kubernetes integration looks like. Um, all right. Good. Now let's take a, a bit closer look at the uh, reactive mode. <clears throat> so as, a, as I've said before, for the reactive mode, we need an external system um, which controls um, the, the resources and is able to allocate or start and stop task managers. This can be um, a custom solution, but if you're running on a um, popular cloud offering or using Kubernetes, you could also use the Kubernetes horizontal pod autoscaler, GCP autoscaling, or in AWS, you can use the autoscaling group feature. Um, so what you would do there is you would define some, some metrics or signals on which to react. Um, so for example, let's, let's um, assume we want to monitor the average CPU load. <clears throat> so you would define this as a metric and define a threshold for this metric. Whenever this, um, the average CPU load exceeds this threshold, um, you would start a new task manager. So let's assume we have a Flink cluster running um, and we consume from some queue and then a spike in our event rate happens. So the autoscaling group configured to monitor the CPU load would see that, that um, due to the spike, we are requiring um, more resources to, uh, or we are above our um, average or our threshold. So we need to start a new task manager. The task manager will then um, join the cluster and, and Flink will rescale the job. At the moment, this happens by taking a save point and resuming um, the job with the change parallelism from the safe point. Um, the important bit here is um, that there's no interaction uh, from the Flink side with the external system. So this means that this, that this mode, mode works with all cluster frameworks. It even works in standalone mode. Um, the only thing you need, um, you need to define like the external system uh, and when to, to rescale and give it a pointer how to start a new task manager, that's all. All right, so far so good. Now I guess comes the obvious question, does any of this work? Um, I would say let's try, let's um, yeah, find it out. Um, so um, for this purpose, I've, I hope you can see it. <clears throat> um, all right, I did like this. Um, yep, I've, um, started Minikube on my machine to have a local Kubernetes cluster. So you see it here. <clears throat> and um, first I want to demonstrate the active uh, Kubernetes mode. 
for that, I've de um, prepared, um, first of all, the container image, which contains the code for the active uh, Kubernetes integration. Um, I've defined a job manager deployment and the job manager service to expose um, the, the REST endpoint to the external world. Okay, so first of all, let's start um, <clears throat> the service and, um, and let's create the deployment. Let's see whether something's running. Yeah, we have a Flink job manager pod running, which is um, the application master. Let's check whether it's actually um, running, and it seems to run. <clears throat> so here, this IP is the Minikube IP. Uh, good, at the moment we have no job running, so there are also no task managers. This is expected. Okay, and then let's, um, let's submit a demo job. Um, we start with a parallelism of one, in detached mode, and here we specify the REST endpoint to which to submit the job, which is the Minikube IP and the port under which we have exposed the, um, the REST endpoint. The demo job itself is very simple. It's simply a, a source and a sync. Um, but for demo purposes, it should be enough. All right, we have submitted something. Let's see. Um, it arrived at the... Um, dispatcher, and it's now being executed. We see we have one task manager, one task lot, and no available task lots, meaning that all task lots are consumed by this job. And here we see we're executing um, this job with a parallelism of one. Okay, let's try to rescale it. Um, <clears throat> for that, I need the job ID. Um, and I want to scale it up to a parallelism of four. So, parallelism of four, again, I specify the master and I am um, the job ID that um, Flick knows which job to rescale. So, um, let's see what happens. Um, so, <clears throat> the client told us it has been rescaled and apparently did something, so now we have four task managers running, so four task manager pods, and the job is now actually executed with a parallelism of four. So internally we have taken a save point, stopped the job, and resumed the job from the save point with the um, new parallelism. Um, if we now stop the job, um, Flink should realize that it no longer needs the, um, all of these resources and release them so that other um, Kubernetes applications can, can use them. And this should not keep to uh, keep a single one. It should eventually also release this task manager. Let's see. Yes, it did this. All right. Um, good. So this is um, the active, the demo was the demo for the active Kubernetes integration. Um, let me quickly clean up. And um, let's take a look at the um, second part of the demo, the reactive container mode. So let me quickly check, check that there are no pods running. Perfect. Um, again, I've prepared um, the container images for the reactive container mode. Here, the container image uh, runs um, the standalone job um, cluster entry point and already and also contains the job and the reactive container um, code. Um, I've created a defined a job cluster job, um, which is similar to deployment, just that uh, once the, uh, it succeeds, it uh, doesn't get restarted, um, the pod, um, the service to expose the port, and this time I have a task manager deployment. So I don't have a fancy automatic uh, external service um, doing the rescaling. Um, for the purpose of demo, of the, for the purpose of this demo, we will do it manually, but should be good enough. So the task manager deployment basically defines the task manager pod. All right, let's start everything. 
Um, good. So we see we have a, um, the application master running and a single task manager uh, pods also running. So we should, if we refresh, see that our job is being executed um, with a palisman of one and on one um, task manager. Now let's use um, Kubernetes um, scaling feature to uh, or scale the, the um, task manager deployment. So we do this by via cube control, scale deployment, think task managers, and we set the replicas to three. <clears throat> now um, Kubernetes will start two additional task manager pods. And let's see what's happening. So first of all, the task managers register, and we get two um, additional slots, which are now used by this job. Um, so what Flink basically did to realize there are now more slots, uh, to again a save point, uh, we started the, uh, the job uh, from the save point with the adapted um, Palosin. But it did not, um, um, Flink was not actively asking for these um, resources. All right, so much for the demo. Let's get back to the last part of um, the presentation. <clears throat> All right, so what is actually the current state? Uh, and what was, um, yeah, just demo. Um, so first of all, uh, I wanna highlight that um, we have some on, on the Flink website and also on the, the uh, Flink repo, we have some uh, recommendations how to deploy job and session clusters on Kubernetes. Um, so there are some scripts to build Docker images, for example, and there are also example uh, Kubernetes resource configs which you can use and um, yeah, specialize. There is the standalone job cluster entry point, uh, which can be used to, to build self-contained uh, containers, uh, which also contain the job. So um, if you want to get rid of uh, the additional step of submitting a job to a cluster, you could use this entry point to build um, your um, container images. For um, the active Kubernetes integration and the reactive container mode. So the active Kubernetes integration, for the demo purposes, I actually used um, code um, written by Shunhui Shi, who's also here. Um, so kudos to you. Uh, it's, um, I would say, uh, almost done. Uh, for parts of the, the code, there are already PRs open. Um, I expect that the next, uh, the remaining parts will be uh, opened very soon so that we can hopefully integrate the active Kubernetes integration into the next Flink release. That's my personal uh, hope. Um, for the reactive container mode, um, we are in a bit earlier uh, development stage. Um, so the demo was a bit mocked, um, to be frank. Um, but the important bit is that uh, like you should get how, how we envision it to work. So there's a design out, there's uh, also an implementation plan, um, but now it needs to, to um, be implemented. Um, yep. <coughs> All right, this brings me to uh, my last slide. So what have you seen today? So I hope you've seen that there's uh, some activity on, um, on improving Flink's deployment options and features. So um, um, concretely, the reactive container mode um, will support applications as first-class citizens. So um, you no longer have to think about clusters, um, but simply about processes. So this should ease operations quite a bit. The active Kubernetes integration is um, coming very soon. Um, so um, yeah, I, the last thing which remains uh, for me to do is um, the call for action. So if you wanna, if you're interested in these features and wanna um, stay up to date, then I would recommend you to subscribe to the mailing lists. Um, if you have some feedback ideas and wanna participate in the Flink development, then do so. I can only encourage you. Um, the community uh, appreciates every helping hand. And by doing that, <clears throat> you can basically help designing Flink's future. So thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> Questions. 
Hi, uh, I was wondering if this native Kubernetes integration has uh, it has anything to do with the Blinks uh, PR or their branch that contains a full blown Kubernetes integration? Like, is it same shared code base or is it something separate? Um, as far as I know, it's something separate, but to be honest, I haven't checked out the uh, Kubernetes integration in the Blink branch, to be honest. Um, so you might know more than uh, I do, um, but Shunhui um, might um, answer this question better than me. Um, as far as I know, it was like um, a separate effort. Uh, they are separate, the Kubernetes integration and the um, Blink branch, they're different. So we can submit this part for work into the community. Yeah, separately. Yeah, thank you. When you were demoing the um, active and the reactive in Kubernetes, what did either of those solutions involve having more than one job manager? Because I'm one of the one of the problems that we run into right now with a single job manager in Kubernetes is that if that goes down, then it takes a while before anyone can submit new jobs because we have to wait for a job recovery to occur. So would that still be a limitation in the new system? <clears throat> uh, no, I don't think so. Um, um, you can have standby um, job managers and, and dispatchers also in Kubernetes. You simply need to um, change the deployment of the application master to have a, a, well more replicas than one. Uh, and you would need some uh, leader election, so Zookeeper, um, to make sure, well to figure out which of these pods is the leader to actually execute the job. Okay, and that would that would already be part of what's delivered. Yes, exactly. Okay, thanks. Hey, I'm just curious um, how the memory scaling working, the auto scaling. Do you scale if you want to change the memory, or if you want to scale up? How do you do that? Uh, which memory scaling you mean? Memory. If changing the memory in the how the in the task manager when you create the task manager, how the memory is assigned to the task manager, is a static or it's a. Um, at the moment, you define um, the the amount of memory a task manager pod gets uh, when you define the deployment of the task manager. Um, so this this stays a constant uh, over the lifetime of the cluster. Um, and um, you would, at the moment, you statically separate the available um, resources among all slots a task manager offers. So that's basically pretty much the same as um, how we do it also in standalone mode at the moment. Um, and Yarn and Mesos, you, you specify uh, when you submit the cluster how large or how much memory a task manager should get. Thank you. Coming over. Um, you talked a little bit about the ability to auto scale at an operator operator level and increase and decrease the parallelism. What kind of a are we looking timeline? What kind of a timeline are we looking at that started or? <laughs> um, speaking of speaking about timelines is always uh, hard uh, if you have a moving target. Um, um, at the moment, uh, I would not expect it to, to be uh, done with the next release. Uh, I hope that we can make considerable uh, progress uh, within the um, release after the next release. Um, so um, I think the earliest uh, would be like in six months. Uh, yeah. Even though I personally would, would have done it earlier, but it's just um, a lot of work to be done. Um, Any more? Yeah, we do have room. Thank you. Hi, thanks for that. Um, in the reactive mode, is there any special thing one must do to remove a task manager to scale down? Or is the task manager essentially disappearing? How can we get it so that the job, so the node is drained, you know, the task manager is drained? Thank you. Um, I think the, the first uh, version, it will be simply disappearing, meaning that um, a scale down event uh, would be triggered by a failover, uh, which um, depending on, um, on your job, 
and uh, the checkpoint settings um, might be uh, a problem because you, you might um, fall back um, too far. Um, in the future, I can, can see that uh, one adds a, a signal which you can send to, to Flink to drain a certain task manager um, before it gets uh, killed to make it, um, this, this process uh, more graceful. Um, yeah. But of course, this would then uh, require a bit more logic on the external system side as well, like to do send first the signal, wait until the response comes, um, maybe add a timeout. Um, yes, <coughs> basically. Where is the in the active mode, is it more graceful? Um, <clears throat> in the in a downscale. Yep, yeah, um, there it's uh, easier um, to, to do. Um, basically, I mean, there Flink is in charge of um, the resource. It knows where the um, ta where tasks are running, uh, and uh, it can. I mean, it's not in the code yet, but it's easier to implement to uh, move tasks from one task manager to another, yeah. not to drain it and then to release it. Yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, I just want to clarify the uh, question that Matt asked earlier. Are we going to be able to scale the job manager so we can have multiple instances of a job manager, or are we still limited to a single job manager running with um, standby job managers? Um, what is the difference between standby job managers and multiple job managers? Um, multiple active job managers that are load balanced versus a standby job manager that only uh, comes uh, active when the uh, when the leader dies. Um, the that's going to be uh, what, what will be supported. Um, so um, <clears throat> at the moment, I mean, it's basically what you have also in, in um, standalone mode. For example, if you use the standby feature, the same thing can can um, be executed on Kubernetes uh, as well. So you will have some some leader election, and um, if the the current leader dies. Uh, depending on the uh, on, on the session timeout um, on some heartbeats, um, you will or Sukuba will tell you, um, okay, there was a leader died, and now you are the leader, and then the job manager will, um, which got the new um, leadership, will take over and uh, resume the job from the latest checkpoint. That's basically also how, also how it works, um, like with standby, uh, standalone standby job managers. Okay. Um, yeah, but um, if you have ideas about how to improve it, then uh, we can also talk afterwards. Um, and well, I would like to learn more about the requirements um, since you're asking about this. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> then uh, let's thank Till again. For the <laughs>